A business trip turns deadly when a state auditor is found at the bottom of a ravine. Somebody was mad and they took it out on this victim before they actually executed him. We all knew that foul play had occurred. There's a killer on the loose and police have little to go on. But we didn't have any blood evidence, we didn't have any fingerprints. Until a psychic breathes new life into the case. I'm seeing a murder now. Oh my God, it's so dangerous. But are her visions enough to catch a killer in a lie? We knew that we were only going to get one chance to speak with Eugene Moore. And will a psychic's chilling premonition come true? You won't take him alive. Shelby, Montana, population 3,300. Part of the Montana High Line, stretching 650 miles from North Dakota to the Idaho border. It's a crossroads where Highway 2 and Interstate 13 meet, a transient place. The last stop for truckers and trains heading to Canada. On the morning of November 13, 1989, 40-year-old state tax auditor Walter Sullivan left his home in Great Falls and made the 45-mile drive to Shelby for a business trip. He never returned. Walt was one of the field representatives who worked out in, in the field, working with employers, collecting taxes, making sure that employers were reporting properly. Sue Moore worked alongside Walter for 13 years. He was a dedicated employee who had worked for the state for more than 18 years. When Walter fails to show up for two of his appointments, his co-workers begin to worry. I called the governor's office. I mean, I will never forget this. Whoever is chief of staff or whoever the person was that I talked to said, he'll show up when he sobers up. And I almost dropped the phone. I said, you got this all wrong. Their indifference angered Sue. She knew Walt to be a family man. He'd married his high school sweetheart and was the proud father of two boys. It would take 24 hours for Shelby police to issue a missing persons report for 40-year-old Walter Sullivan. We began uh, backtracking every place that uh, Mr. Sullivan had went. Dave Robbins was the Shelby County investigator on the case. He learns that Walter had three appointments the day he went missing and only made it to one. We're suspecting that the last person that talked to him was Gene Moore. Eugene Moore owned and operated a truck stop in Shelby. When police contact him, he says he did meet with Walter and that he left the same day. A week goes by, and Walter's disappearance is big news. The whole town is talking. We start hearing that he was here, he was there, he's turning up all over town at certain times of the day. And I knew Walt really, really well, and the idea that he was off gallivanting and sporting about somewhere was just nuts. I mean, just nuts, and of course, a horrible, horrible insult to his family. We were developing information because we were hoping beyond hope that this man would turn up safe and alive someplace. November 22nd, nine days after Walter went missing, his mangled car is spotted 250 feet down in a ravine. We picked our way down away from it so we wouldn't disturb anything, but as you peered over the top, you could see a body laying down there, so we knew we had a crime scene. There lay the lifeless body of Walter Sullivan. Uh, the car was pretty banged up because it went off this cliff and rolled down there, so um, a lot of what we did in, in video footage was to collect the evidence and document where it was. We, it was our worst fear was realized, and we were devastated. All I remember doing is, is crying and wanting to see, wanting to know that something was being done. An autopsy would reveal that Walter Sullivan's death was no accident. The victim had been beaten severely about the head and the face, and that he had been shot uh, at close quarters in the back of the head. Somebody was mad, and they were, uh, and they took it out on this on this victim before they actually executed him. Who killed Walter Sullivan and why? With no fingerprints and few clues, police revisit the last man who saw him alive. Eugene Moore gives them a more detailed account. 
he said around 8 o'clock that Mr. Sullivan left to go to his place to do the audit because that's where he keeps the records. He said that Mr. Sullivan did not follow him directly to his place, arrived a few minutes later, and at that point had another gentleman with him who he described as a Native American with long black hair. Uh, he stated that Mr. Sullivan only wanted a couple, a couple years state tax returns and some checks from his ledger book, and that's all. When police do a background check on Moore, they learn he is an ex-Marine and has been trained in combat warfare. They also learn he threatened other auditors in the past. We all knew that foul play had occurred. I mean, we knew it. Walt had said earlier at a uh, meeting with some of the other field reps that he was going to go to Shelby and see a guy who he was concerned about, who he knew was going to be difficult to work with. Eugene Moore's business was flagged when the state learned he hadn't filed a tax return in more than 15 years. We're talking about somebody who truly subscribed to that whole tax protester notion. Walt often had a history of bringing employers like that around so that they would start out being very anti-government. You know, and when Walt got done with them, he made them see why he was doing what he was doing, and which is really what the very best of our field reps were able and still are able to do is, is promote that. There was a gentleman that worked at Mr. Moore's truck stop, and, Mr. And, this, and this guy had been laid off, and so he went to file for unemployment, and uh, there was no files, there was nothing on him, so Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Moore had turned in nothing to the state. That's what precipitated this audit that was coming from Walter Sullivan. Police obtain a warrant to search Moore's business and home, but find no hard evidence. I felt I had good evidence in regard, though it was circumstantial. We had no, no physical evidence to tie uh, our suspect to this crime, other than the fact of his story and what he had said to us. Another snag, Moore's wife, Tammy, provides an alibi for her husband, claiming he was at home that entire evening. It was during that time that, uh, or after that interview, that we called him back to try to do another one, and uh, we were contacted by a lawyer out of Cutbank who said, I now represent Mr. Gene Moore, and he's not going to talk to you gentlemen again, so I'll leave him alone. And, and uh, so we backed off for, uh, for a while. With nothing else to go on, the case is stalled and sits on the shelf for six years. Family and friends of Walter Sullivan couldn't let it go. A state worker murdered on the job and no one was doing anything about it. The worst part of the aftermath of Walt's tragedy was knowing that this employer was wandering around literally on the loose and apparently, as we found out later, had changed businesses, had moved around up there, none of which I knew about. It was infuriating. I was mad to tears. Finally, Sue's anger turned to action. She writes a letter to the local paper demanding justice for Walter Sullivan. That single letter hit a nerve. News media across the state picked up the story. The pressure actually came from outside. It came from uh, news media, um, you know, Great Falls. We were constantly being called, and I think people were upset that a crime like this would happen in this community. It pressured Montana's Attorney General to assign Joe Uribe, an agent from the Department of Justice, to solve Walter Sullivan's murder once and for all. We had a, a meeting between all the officers that were involved in the early investigation and myself. Joe, right off the bat, he saw the difficulties with the case itself. He knew everything we had. He saw the evidence. He saw the statements. So he knew what we were up against. After reviewing the case, uh, I, I felt that there were some things we could do to help get the case going again. That something different was a psychic. And I got home. And I turned on the TV. I was pretty tired, but I, I was amped up after reading the case file. So I turned on the television, and there was a program about psychics on there. Uh, after watching her uh, on three different cases that she worked on, I felt that maybe she could be some help to us. A psychic encounter was about to ignite a six-year cold case, and her visions would stun police. This was revenge. In northern Montana, a state auditor is found dead at the bottom of a ravine. He'd been beaten and shot in the head. Police have a suspect, but no hard evidence. The case stalls. Six years go by, and family and friends demand answers. Who killed Walter Sullivan? 
Feeling the heat, the state assigns a new investigator to the case. Joe Uribe knows he has to solve this murder no matter what it takes, even if it means traveling more than 2,000 miles to ask a psychic for help. We decided to fly down uh, to Florida uh, because we had some evidence, and she wanted us to mail the evidence to her, and we didn't want to do that. I was still pretty skeptical. I'd never worked with a psychic before, nor had I ever dreamed of working with a psychic. I was very skeptical, and uh, I, honestly, I thought it was just a waste of time. But after we talked about it a while, we thought, since the case was stalled, what harm could it do? Noreen Renier is a psychometrist who specializes in missing persons and homicide cases. Psychometry is touching an object and getting impressions in your head, in your mind, about the object. And we are energy, and it, a, a residue of it is left behind in an object. In very passionate crimes of hate or love, it seems like it leaves more energy than just a missing person walking in the woods and, 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 and being lost. So homicide is easier for me because the energies are much more powerful. Although violent, they're easier for me to pick up. Investigators use a video camera to document the session. Give me the first name of the victim, and then uh, what I'm going to do is just very briefly describe the victim, just enough so you know I'm in tune to it. In our case, we brought um, several pieces of clothing, and we even brought the bullet that was in the victim's head. I remember touching the items, the clothing, and I got a picture of the victim. I can feel uh, facial hair. Uh, I she feel told us hair. that uh, yeah. she could see the victim and that he had facial hair. Walter Sullivan had a beard. She told us that he was uh, short, stocky, uh, physique, short neck. Uh, basically described Walter to the T. Without a word from the investigators, Noreen has no idea whether she has locked on to their victim, Walter Sullivan. I'm sure that they thought it was a more scientific process if they didn't react, but somehow I needed that little bit of feedback, uh, but I, I kept going without any feedback. We told her nothing about the case, and some of the things she said was just incredible. I, I see a blue metal building. I see something like an antenna, like three going up, train tracks going, going close by. There was railroad tracks very close to the blue shed. Remarkably, Noreen is describing the home of their prime suspect, Eugene Moore. The physical features that Noreen described, such as a, a blue metal building, there was a blue metal building on the property. Uh, she said there was a railroad track close by. Well, just right across the road from him was a railroad track. And it was, it was strikingly accurate. At one point, a name just sort of popped in my head, the name Clark. C-L-A-I-R. No, I just feel that sort of name coming in, uh, Clark. And they sort of looked at each other, but said nothing. Came out kind of spontaneously that she said this word Clark, and uh, incidentally, the body and the car uh, were found on the Clark Ranch uh, about nine miles southwest of town. We were just amazed. Uh, we couldn't believe it. Uh, in fact, the hair was standing on the back of my neck a time or two. And now she gives them a piece of information they didn't know. The moment she touched the bullet, she had a vision of an attack on mm -hmm. Walter Sullivan. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I was ambushed. Oh, I'm hurting. They're hitting me on the head. We knew that Walter had been beaten, but we didn't know how many people were involved with it uh, or what the circumstances were. This was planned. The torture. This was about revenge. And then all of a sudden, I had this excruciating pain in the back of my head. Uh, something went in her head, there was some pain in her head, and that's exactly where Walter was shot. We had developed information about these two other suspects, but they in fact had been eliminated from being in the area. But Noreen was able to put together for us that they were part of the uh, ambush that occurred out at this blue metal building. But she basically laid out the scenario of what we believe is the actual fact of what happened with Walter Sullivan. But investigators were about to be amazed even more. That is so dangerous. You won't take him alive. I saw the face in my head. 
one eye at a time. Each feature, the artist put it together. Uh, eyebrows uh, more close uh, to the eyes. So we had two faces for them. One is a male and one was a female. She provided information to her artist, uh, which very accurately depicted our main suspect and his wife. They again looked at each other, thanked me, packed up their stuff and left. Again, no feedback on how well I did or how badly I did. No, no grades were given. What Noreen didn't know was that her visions gave police new reason to go back to their prime suspect, Eugene Moore. For me, it brought all of the elements together and I knew at that point that we had the right man. We'd done intensive homework. We, uh, uh, we went back step by step through his statement and we reviewed everything he told us and we went out to look to see if this is true or not true. Uribe visits Moore at his truck stop and tells him he is with the Attorney General's office. He says he's there to close the Walter Sullivan case once and for all and wants to hear Moore's side of the story. He opened up just like a flower and said, well, absolutely. I've been waiting to talk to somebody. I have a lot of things that I want to say. This time, Moore's story is very different from the one he told six years ago. He states that Walter did show up at his truck stop and asked for his records. Moore told Sullivan they were in the blue building and that he should get them himself. He then says he never saw Sullivan again. And here he comes out with an entirely different set of information, a, a whole different story. And of course, it was contrary to everything he told us back in 1989. Back in 1989, Moore claimed that he met Walter at his home and that he noticed a Native American in his car. He personally handed Walter his records and watched them both drive away. It's typical when a person is lying to you, a year later or two years later, whatever, they don't remember their lies. Everybody remembers the truth, but you can't remember when you lie. Uribe decides to take a chance. After six years, police had no new evidence against Moore, but what they did have was a psychic scenario of how Walter Sullivan was killed, and Uribe uses it on Moore. On the morning of November 13th, 1989, Walter Sullivan meets Eugene Moore at his house to discuss his taxes. Sullivan follows Moore towards his blue shed. It's there that he's ambushed by Moore and two other men they stuff Sullivan's body into the trunk of his own car, drive nine miles, and push it off the side of Clark Road, where it drops 250 feet down into a ravine. Moore had no idea what we knew, and that worked very well for us, because uh, it acted like we had the details of what actually happened on the day of the murder. And the more we got into it, the more broken down he became. Incredibly, the psychic's version of the crime was true enough to convince Moore to break down and confess. You could just see an emotional change on his face. After six years, police finally have a confession. But do they have their man? He went from a very positive, hey, I have something to say here and I want the world to know. I didn't do this and here's why. But as we broke him down and as we showed all the discrepancies, you could just see him kind of shirk and shrink in his chair. And then he began to come around to the point where he wanted to, uh, hey, if I confess to this, what's gonna happen to me? And then he started trying to make arrangements or cut a deal with us right on the spot to uh, determine how many years in prison he was gonna get. He had told us he didn't want to go to prison and that we'd never take him alive. A psychic's vision is about to go unheeded. You won't take him alive. A Montana state auditor is found dead near the small town of Shelby. After six years, a co-worker's letter would make state headlines and puts investigator Joe Uribe under the gun to solve the crime. With no new leads, Uribe asks a psychic for help. Her visions of the crime send the police back to their prime suspect. When confronted, he confesses. His story finally crumbled right before his eyes. He broke down. At last, police have Eugene Moore exactly where they want him. But instead of taking him into custody, police decide to follow protocol and let him go. Our attorney general instructed us not to arrest him because 
Uh, it had been so long since the murder. We wanted to put it into a, a warrant of arrest with a information that we would file with the judge and let a judge determine, based on the information we had, whether or not there was enough grounds or probable cause to go ahead and make the arrest. It was a costly mistake, one that the psychic had predicted. He's so dangerous. You won't take him alive. He had told us he didn't want to go to prison and that we'd never take him alive. And once he walked out that door, I knew he'd made a big mistake. When police return the next day with an arrest warrant, Eugene Moore is gone. He's spotted heading towards the Canadian border. We knew he had a handgun and we knew he had a rifle. And uh, we felt at that point that it was very dangerous. But we had to stop him. We called ahead and uh, radioed ahead and had uh, additional forces come in. And they used stop sticks, which are devices that are used to blow out the tires on a vehicle. And we had them deployed in such a manner that uh, he, uh, we got his tires flattened. Uh, and in the event of that, he even still went a mile and a half after his tires went down, because he didn't want to stop. Police do all they can to stop Moore, and when they finally do, he tries to shoot himself, fails, and turns his gun on police. Several shots were exchanged. Two officers were shot before Mr. Moore was, in fact, shot and killed. Noreen's premonition was right. Police would never take Eugene Moore alive. Officials say it began when they tried to arrest Eugene Moore for a 1989 murder. But minutes later, deputies found themselves on a chase. Moore led them down this road, and that is apparently when the gunfire broke out. We didn't want him to, uh, to kill himself or get shot. We wanted him to go to prison. Being these anti-government leanings that he had, um, didn't feel that he owed the government anything. He's a, he's a businessman, but and uh, in fact hadn't paid taxes in years. Eugene Moore's death meant there would be no justice for Walter Sullivan. Any evidence of Moore's accomplices died with him. All the evidence that we had, nothing could be corroborated, we, you know, we, as far as his involvement went, and, uh, and, and especially any, any closure for uh, the victim's family in a, in a court case at all. We should never have allowed him to get away from us. We should have arrested him on the spot. Looking back on it all, that probably was uh, the biggest mistake in my career. But there's no mistaking that a psychic's vision helped police to force a killer's hand. The thing that Noreen Rainier did for us is, you know, police work, we did all the basics. We went back and did all the groundwork. And all the elements were there, but there just wasn't quite enough to make the arrest. I think I gave them more ammunition and more confidence about what really happened. So when they confronted the murderer, they could bring these things out by my clues, my information, my scene, what happened to Walter and how he was killed. I, as an investigator, would not discount any information from any source. You get it, you filter it. If it's of use, you use it, you run with it. And that's the way I view uh, the psychic. I think I'm accurate in all my cases. Uh, uh, never 100%, n nothing is ever 100%, even in this reality, in the psychic world, of course it's not. But I felt very accurate, I felt the pictures were coming, I was seeing clearly, I felt I did my job, and I think I did it well. I don't feel I solve crimes, I think I'm, I'm just a small part in helping it come to a successful conclusion. Sue Moore's efforts to convince the state to reinvestigate would bring Walter's killer down and change the way the state of Montana did business. Field reps now carry cell phones, are much better about documenting where they are and how long they're going to be. And frankly, if there's any question at all, they subpoena the employer into the sheriff's office. Walt was a tough guy and he believed he could handle his job. I mean, the reason he asked to be moved out to the field from being a computer guy was he really wanted to work with employers. He had a great talent and skill for it. And for me, that was really the great tragedy of Walt's story, was this guy who loved his job, loved what he did, cared so much about providing a good service as a state employee, was not served well, in my opinion, during that time. It was a, a very awful thing to live through. I, I cannot imagine what his family went through as a friend. 
I know how incredibly painful uh, and tragic it was. To me, there, there was just a sense that at least it's resolved. Sue Moore was determined to keep Walter Sullivan's memory alive. She lobbied, and finally in March 2004, 15 years after his death, the state renamed a building in Walter Sullivan's honor. Walt was, in many ways for me, um, a mentor. I mean, there's not a time I walk into that building and see that plaque and don't have a memory of Walt in that building. It's great to have that there, but I sure wish we didn't have to have it.